I started my freshman year of college at a university in my hometown that's pretty nice. I'm not going to share too much about it, but it has a smaller amount of students, but enough that you don't really run into people too often. I lived on campus, and I was only 17 at the time. I had Tinder, of course, as I was fresh out of a relationship and looking to experience new things in college. I matched with this one boy, Asher, who seemed nice enough. Pretty socially awkward, but I never really minded because I have anxiety issues myself, and I'm really sympathetic to it. Because of that, I ignored a lot of the warning signs I should have. We texted for a while, and he seemed really nice and caring. He wanted to know a lot about me, which I wasn't too keen on sharing, but I told him the basics, and we texted kind of regularly. He lived on campus as well and invited me to hang out. At that time, things didn't seem too sketchy, so I was completely down. When I first met him, that's when things started to get uncomfortable. We hung out in his dorm, which was pretty standard overall. I got cozy with him on his couch. I'd say almost cuddling, but not quite. Still really standard. When we started talking more, I realized how uncomfortable things really were. He kept making comments that just put me off, but I tried to ignore them. Things like, I've never cuddled with anyone before, sorry if I'm doing it wrong, and so many comments about how he really liked me a lot and wanted me to stay forever. Weird word choice, but whatever, he's just trying to be nice. I'll let him down easy, I thought. I ended that hangout pretty quickly for some fake excuse and went right back to my room. He kept texting me and professing how much he was into me and I told him, sorry, but... I'm not looking for any kind of relationship, so I do not want to keep things romantic. A bad lie, but I'm very non-confrontational and didn't want to be mean. That's when things started to get really weird. He sent me this long paragraph saying about how it was okay I didn't want a relationship now, that he'd wait for me and save his virginity for me. We had never talked anything like that before. I never even really told him I liked him or even flirted back, I just never turned him down. It was one of the creepiest messages I'd ever received. Unfortunately, that was just the start of all the weird things to come. He wouldn't leave me alone even though I kept trying to de-escalate things and I kept running into him all over campus. I wasn't sure how he suddenly was nearby when classes ended and I wasn't sure why suddenly we'd both be in the dining hall at the same times, even though I hadn't changed my regular routine, but I just tried to brush it off. Definitely a mistake. I ended up turning him down completely because I was getting creeped out and couldn't figure out how he wasn't understanding that I didn't want anything romantic with him. He started guilt tripping me telling me about how he was going to hurt himself and no one was ever going to love him. I've been in manipulative relationships in the past and I recognized that behavior right away and shut it down. I told him I couldn't be friends with him and, in my head, that was that. He didn't reply for a while, but when he did, everything went to chaos. I was luckily out of town at the time for a concert, so that made me feel a lot better. He went off, sent me paragraph after paragraph about how horrible of a person I was and how I was just all these terrible names and needed to be put in my place. Regular are nice guy things. I could handle that, I just ignored it. Then once the regret set in, he made it his mission to win my love however possible. He apologized profusely told me how he couldn't be all alone and I was his only friend and how much he loved me. Whatever. Terrible, but I didn't care about that. Then, I guess to prove his dedication, he did the creepiest thing yet. First, he told me he was outside of my room. We did not live in the same dorm building, and you can't get into the buildings unless you live there. I don't know who let him in. I wasn't there and my roommate was out, so that was okay. I texted back at that point and told him to leave and how wrong and creepy that was, and he pulled out his last resort. He just sent me screenshots of my contact in his phone. On Apple devices, you can fill in tons of information and have a note section, 
everything was entirely full. He knew my home address, my room number on campus, my parents' and brothers' names, my pets' names, my schedule. It was terrifying because I'm a fairly private person. My Instagram is my only social media and I do not share that much on it. I don't think I'll ever find out how he discovered all of that about me. I blocked him on everything right away and reported him to the school. The school did nothing at all. I still see him on campus and he still tries to approach me when he sees me. I always duck and run and it's worked so far. To the terrifying Tinder match who may still be following me around to this day. Please leave me alone. I'm a female, 23 now, and the story I was 21 with a 4 month old baby. He's mine and he's 2 now. I'm about 5 foot 9, a bit overweight and I have social anxiety around new people. I went with my sister, 26, 5 feet tall, to her work as she worked at a very nice restaurant in a shopping center. And we went straight there for her 6pm start after being in the city all day, collecting money for a cat rescue. I'm just chilling out, eating good food and binging on Reddit when I decide I want to smoke. I know, bad habit. So I pack up the kid lit and let my sister know I'm going out to the car to park to have a smoke as she passes through the dining area. The car park was about 70 meters away from the restaurant, had good lighting and because it was so late, I could hang around near the doors. This is where it gets creepy. The security guard was doing his rounds, about my height, an Indian. He decides to check on me. I mean, that's cool man, I'm just having a smoke. In the conversation went something like this. How you doing, you okay? I'm pretty good, just waiting for my sister to get off of work. Good, good. Your baby. Very cute baby, I have four at home. You got a husband? Uh, Yes, he's my baby, that's good. I have a fiance. A complete lie. I was 100% single, but he was already making me anxious. I can be husband. I look after baby for you. I look after you. (laughs) Uh, no thanks. I'm sure your wife wouldn't appreciate that. No, no, no. Wife love baby. Wife will love you. You come home with me? I finish my smoke, been moving the pram further away from him each second. (laughs) No thanks. I'm going now. He then follows me inside. I go all around the mostly closed shopping center hoping to lose him in Kohl's. I lost him for about 5 seconds but Kohl's had shut for the night. The only place left open was my sister's work so I went back there even though I didn't want him to know where I was. As I was about to walk into the restaurant I saw him coming up the escalator. He was still watching me. I take the last two steps towards the hostess who happened to be the owner's daughter and told her what was going on. At this point, the security guard is standing in front of the restaurant still staring at me. The hostess takes me to a semi-secluded booth and goes to talk to her dad about the situation. As she's gone, creepy security guard came into the dining area, searched for me, and then came and sat in my booth, way too close to me and my child. How old are you? I want to ravish you pretty women. You be mother to my babies. We make cute babies. At this point, it was very clear that I was very uncomfortable. And he still made it worse. Don't worry, I security, I protect you and baby. He's reaching across the table with one hand now. The other hand is reaching towards my pram. I'm frozen. I don't care about the hand near me, I'm watching the other one. Nobody touches my baby. I'm about to snap, go full mama bear mode when the owner, 40s to 50s, 6 foot plus, big wide build of the restaurant steps in asking if there's a problem. Is there a problem here? English is not his native language, but he gets the point across. His English skills deteriorate when he gets angry. This is important to the story, I promise. No no problem, just talking to my lovely lady. Uh, This is a customer. Has she done something wrong? Uh, no, never. She's my lady. See, we're, we're going to get married. 
He begins to grin creepily. The silent warning to play along is etched into his face. Finding comfort in the presence of the manager. Please just leave me alone. I just want to eat my dinner. <laughs> oh, funny lady. See, we we joke. I don't I don't know you. Please just leave me alone. She says she wants you to leave now. She's just messing. She loves me. I'd be waiting for you, my pretty lady. He leaves at that point. The manager makes sure I'm okay and moves to the employee break room and fills my sister in. Two hours later and my sister has finished her shift. We pack up and head to the car. SG, the security guard, out of nowhere, he was actually waiting for me. I take pretty lady and baby home now. Come on, pretty lady, we go home. Like an angel steps out from his car, right behind the security guard. She's going home, with her sister. No, oh, pretty lady, mine. She come home with me. Get in the car. I take care of this. So we get in the car and go home. Found out the next day from my sister that her boss had physically restrained the security guard because he went to grab my arm as I was getting in the car, and then got him fired and permanently banned from that shopping center. In my mid-twenties I was bouncing around. I couldn't settle on what to do and after a long and terrible relationship was mostly interested in having fun. I was at university but wasn't the most committed student. I had been working in a restaurant in a hotel but hated it and a friend told me about working as a receptionist in a brothel. It's completely legal where I live and said the money was decent. It fit in well with university, it wasn't difficult and if clients were rude you could just kick them out, unlike hospitality where you had to be polite all the time. I found a place that was looking for receptionists and went for an interview and got a job. And it was fine. I mean, not the most interesting job in the world but it paid okay. I could smoke out the back, back when cigarettes didn't cost $50 a pack. I could study if it was quiet. And I know what everyone is thinking at this point. Receptionist is code for worker, and I promise it isn't. I have no proof, but lying about it doesn't make the story any better. In fact, if I were one of the workers or the ladies of the night there, it might be an even more interesting story. Sadly, no such excitement in my life. We had regular clients, and they all had reputations of some kind. This guy only books half an hour, but always extends his bookings at least once. This guy will pay extra for dirty talk, and a lot of it was innocuous, just information passed between people that we, as receptionists, always heard all about. But some of it was more along the lines of a warning. This guy will try and remove the protection. This guy wants to spank, but won't ask first. And then there was the doctor. The doctor had a lot of money and would potentially book multiple workers for a long time. He paid well for reasonably boring extras, like fancy lingerie or role play, aka nurses' uniforms, but he had a big red warning sign above his head. The first time he came in, one of the other receptionists warned me, no one has to do an intro with him if they don't want to. Warn the girls it's the doctor. I called the intro, i.e. I went into the staff room and said intro in meeting room 1, which generally meant that every available worker should go in, say their name, flirt, whatever, after which one of the receptionists would find out who they wanted to see and how long for, and all the workers stood up and then said, it's the doctor, and all but two sat back down. So I immediately asked what the deal is and they explained that he likes cocaine, he likes workers who like or pretend to like it as well, and he is a neurosurgeon who gets access to all sorts of weird stuff, and often his use is far from pure. Not cut with drain cleaner, but cut with pharmaceuticals like anesthetics used for surgery. He also enjoyed drug insertion. I'm sure you can fill in the blanks. He was sometimes belligerent if workers refuse him after they've started the booking and he was just creepy. When we go in to check with him, 
he'd try and grab us, make us, the receptionists, sit down. And to be clear, I'm not what people would consider attractive. Plus, he'd do it with all the receptionists. He'd grab her hands and try and stroke her arms. He had this super intense stare, like a mannequin that could actually make eye contact. I know that sounds weird, but it's hard to describe. It's like he was staring right into you, but also not seeing you at all. His expressions were weird and just didn't work on his face. Like his mouth would smile or move, but his eyes would change from that intense stare. I guess it might have been what he was on, but it was deeply unsettling and just made you feel sick. Having said all that, there were a few experienced workers who knew how to handle him, get the most out of him whilst experiencing the least possible risk. It's possible to fake snorting something. I didn't know this before that point, hence giving workers the option to meet the client. I can't remember if he saw anyone that first time. If I recall correctly, he had a handful of bookings in the time I was working there. We did have strict instructions not to ever let anyone do an out call with him. This is booking at anywhere other than the brothel. Plus, we had a few other harm minimization strategies. Then, after a while, one of the workers who was okay with seeing him left to go traveling and no one else would see him, so he gradually stopped coming in as no one would intro him. I moved on to receptioning at a different brothel. A new one had opened closer to where I lived and the pay was better, and he showed up again there. I knew he would frequent all the places he could until his reputation overtook him. When he showed up at the new place, I told all the workers about him and no one was okay with seeing him. He only tried a couple more times before he abandoned us. A year or so later, I had moved on to a different job. I couldn't do night shifts anymore and I was chatting with a friend from the brothel who said, Oh my god, did you hear about the doctor? He whacked someone and got arrested. And it was true. The doctor had done that to a worker who had been sent to his apartment. The worker lay dead in his bed for two days. Officially, it was manslaughter, and he also pled guilty to supplying the substance that ended another worker. All this happened because A, he's a terrible dumpster fire human, and B, because one awful brothel manager and the owners behind her put profits in front of safety and kept sending workers to bookings with him without giving them full warnings and specifically sending inexperienced workers and without keeping them in-house. It later came out that the medical board had known of his addiction for many years prior to his arrest and it helped cover up some botched surgeries. It was horrifying to hear about and we both spent some time telling stories we knew about him but then I mostly forgot about it. Then I was chatting with an old friend the other day who reminded me of him and I got on Google. I found out that he's been released from prison. I hope not practicing medicine, but he could be anywhere now. I had an encounter in December of last year that left me feeling very unsettled. I was in a vulnerable position as my partner and I, both female and homeless, I just purchased an RV to live in but we're having trouble finding a spot to rent because it was an older model and we have pets. We parked in the farthest corner of the Walmart parking lot in Bend, Oregon around 10am one day. My partner had errands that needed to be ran and took a bus to do such as I held down the forts and watched the dogs. It was going to be a long day of waiting around for her to get back so we could leave. I went into the store twice to make some purchases earlier in the day. I worked on some maintenance and art before getting bored enough to take a nap. As I was taking the dogs outside beforehand, two police officer vehicles pulled up and parked right next to the RV. At this point, I'm preparing for them to ask me to move the vehicle or tell me I can't park overnight or something. After a while of nothing, I fell asleep anyway. When I woke up, I could tell it was getting toward the evening. The sun was still very much up and considering the police presence, I wasn't particularly in the mindset of anything bad happening. Still, I always carry my pepper spray on me. My partner was not back yet, although I expected her late. She had our only phone, so I went to the store to check the time. 
The officers had already moved at this point, and the parking in the general area was pretty barren, save for one van parked in the spot right behind the RV. I entered the store and went to the restroom in the front. Then I walked to the electronics department to see what time it was on the displays. It was a few minutes before 6pm. I left after only having been in there a few minutes. As I was walking out the door, the crowd in front of me slowly dispersed to veer toward their respective vehicles. I continued walking behind one man who seemingly parked in the same direction as me. He was tall, thin, and scraggly with shoulder-length blonde hair and a black hoodie. I walked maybe 30 feet behind him the whole way. As he passed all the cars by the front of the store, I came to the conclusion that he must be the owner of the van by my RV. He walked with clear direction not looking around for where his car was or anything. After passing the main crowd of the parking lot, I got my pepper spray out of my pocket and held it in hand as a routine safety measure. The man walked between the back of the RV and the driver's side door of the van. I figured he was about to get in, but instead he lingered. I stopped walking in that direction and headed toward a more populated parking area at the next door across the street, since it was closer than Walmart from his end. Then, he looked at me, and we made eye contact for a minute. It felt like he recognized me, as if though he'd been stalking me out and was surprised to see me leaving the store so soon. I continued to walk away while staring at him, and he watched me before slipping around the side of my RV where there were some bushes and a fence with no outlet. I got out at this point, so I got into the other store and walk around blankly staring at things for a bit trying to formulate a plan. It's pretty busy in there with no one at the customer service desk, so I go into the gas station next door and ask to use the phone. I call my partner to explain the situation and tell her not to go directly to the RV. Then I headed back into Walmart, got a coffee at the McDonald's inside, and waited there for another hour till she was able to return. Perhaps I should have called the police as I was worried about my animals. The little dog would bark, but they're not guard dogs, and my possessions being stolen but I had recently called 911 witnessing domestic violence a few days prior only to have them take two hours to show up in the middle of downtown. I was worried they would not only not help, but possibly harass me for parking there. I don't have a driver's license, so having to move the RV before my partner returned would be a dangerous situation. When she arrived, we went to the RV together. The van was gone. Nothing was touched despite one of the windows not locking properly, but the pets were very spooked. Maybe they decided against stealing after I caught them. But I'm not well off, and honestly, one look at that beat-up old thing would tell you I don't have much worth taking. Honestly, just from the look in that guy's eyes, I felt like he wasn't after material possessions. I'm an American living in France. At the time of this incident, I was working in a hotel kitchen for a five-star hotel. I had to drive 30 minutes, catch a 30-minute metro, and then walk another 10 minutes to get to and from this hotel. I'd work from 3 a.m. to 3 p.m. every day. The boss was an idiot, and the customers were uppity idiots who thought five-star meant that staff are not human. Basically, it sucked. One day I was having a particularly terrible shift. My hair was gross, my face was numb from smiling at rude customers, and all I wanted was to go home, take a shower, and go to sleep. So I put my earphones in and waited for the metro. At this stop it was super busy, so the metro opened from both doors, letting people get on one side and off the other. The rest of the stops weren't as busy, so they only opened on the opposite side so people could get out. When the metro arrived, I stepped on and stopped next to the door that wouldn't open again, knowing I could lean back for the rest of the trip. Then, a man in an electric wheelchair rolled on, and he stopped just in front of the same door as I was planning to lean against. He had a couple of bags hanging from the back of his chair, and he wasn't pulled up enough so the doors would shut on his bags. I knew the doors would close and remain closed, so instead of just telling him to pull up a bit... I held the bags forward a bit so that they wouldn't get caught in the door. The door closed, I let go, and the guy smiled at me. 
Then he started talking to me. I had my earphones in so I couldn't hear what he said. I was exhausted, but I'm a nice person so I took them out and talked to him. He clearly had a disability as his speech was pretty hard to understand. My French isn't bad, but it wasn't good enough to understand him. So I told him, I'm sorry, I don't speak French. He immediately switched to English. Ugh, I thought. But again, I'm nice, so I kept talking to him. It was a normal conversation. Where are you from? What are you doing here? How long have you been here? Yada, yada, yada. Then he said, You're beautiful. Are you getting off at X? I was a little weirded out, but I said no, I'm getting off at W, which is one stop before. He said get off at X with me. You can come over and we can hang out. I politely declined and he said, kiss me. Oh, forget it, I thought. I said no and put my earphones back in, ignoring him. He kept talking, but I couldn't hear him and I was blatantly ignoring him. Then he pushed a loud buzzer on his chair to get my attention. Everyone was looking at us now, and I would have looked like a jerk if I'd kept ignoring him. So I pulled my earphones out, and he kept trying to talk to me, asking me if I had a boyfriend, if I wanted to be his girlfriend, if I would kiss him. Keep in mind that I'm like 20 at this point, and he's a solid 50. Finally, my stop arrives. I say goodbye, and he rolls out of the metro with me. I told him this isn't his stop, and he said, I'm coming home with you. I was thoroughly creeped out, but I figured I could ditch him easily at this point. We were two floors underground, and I could easily run up the stairs before he could get on the elevator. Feeling like a complete idiot for trying to ditch a disabled guy, I stick to my plan, sprinting up the stairs, tripping a few times as I do. I get up to the ground floor and walk outside, satisfied that he's gone. As I'm walking to my car, I hear that buzz. He's behind me zooming pretty fast after me. I start running, terrified of this dude who will not leave me alone. I get to my car and I'm so freaked out that my hands are shaking and I have trouble getting the keys in the car. Finally, I do. I hop in and put it in reverse. When I check the mirror, there he is, parked behind my car and buzzing at me. I don't know what to do at this point. I can't reverse and run him over. I'm certainly not getting out to talk to him, but I have to get home so I can't just sit there all day. This standoff lasted for about 10 minutes before he finally just strolls away, glaring at me as he does. I peel out of there and drive home, shaken but satisfied that I'd seen the last of that guy. The next morning as I pull into the parking lot, still sleepy but ready for work, I get out of the car, get down to the metro and... There he is, waiting on the platform. I'd forgotten that the day before I told him that I work every day from 3am to 3pm. He knew I would be there, and he knew when. He smiled when he saw me and started rolling over. I book it back up the stairs, calling my boss on the way and telling him that I'll be late to work. I end up just driving into the city, wasting gas and spending a ton of money on parking. I haven't seen him again, and I've since started going to a different metro station. There are a few other stations that I can park at, but they're sketchy. This guy had very limited movement, he could only use his fingers enough to move the chair, so I know there's probably nothing he could have done to hurt me, and he was probably just a lonely guy who wanted someone to talk to. But I still panic every time I see a wheelchair. When I was growing up, we lived in Baltimore City until I turned 12. This incident happened, I believe, when I was around 7 or 8. I don't remember exactly, but I know it was definitely before I turned 9 because my older brother left for boot camp and then later deployed when I was 9. Both my brother and mother were and are in the military, and he was still at home and not yet in the military when this happened. Also, I am mute. I was born with deformed vocal cords, which isn't super important, but it does affect the story somewhat. Our house was only six blocks from my school, and I would walk home by myself on some days. Sometimes my brother would meet me at my school and walk me home, 
but he played football and baseball and sometimes would be at his school for practice. My mother worked 12-hour shifts as a nurse, so some days she would pick me up, others she wouldn't. Of course, she wasn't too keen on me walking home, but me being a stupid and naive kid had nagged her enough to where she finally let me walk home on those days instead of taking the bus. It was only six blocks, and again, being a kid, it made me feel mature and responsible. I know, stupid me. My mother has always been worried about predators, like most parents are, but she worried that me being mute would make me an easier target since I can't scream. I do always carry a whistle around my neck, and the importance of stranger danger has been drilled into me by my mom. She also had me learning self-defense since I was four, but again, I was only seven or eight at the time, and I hadn't exactly mastered any of these skills. On the day of this event, I was walking home by myself. I was a very lonely kid who didn't have any friends. I'm not announcing that for pity or anything, just to help you understand why I was alone. I usually did a pretty good job of being mindful of my surroundings, but again, I was a kid and my mind would sometimes wander and daydream like any other normal kid. I was about halfway home when it happened. I was passing by a narrow alleyway and out of nowhere I felt myself grabbed very roughly from behind. I felt my body just freeze up in panic. One thing I remember very vividly was the odor. This guy smelled terrible, just awful B.O., like nasty old gym socks that you left in the bottom of your locker and forgot about them until the end of the school year or something. I could feel his hot, horrible breath against the back of my head and neck. He was breathing heavy, like a dog does when it's hot out. He didn't say a word. I just remember his arms wrapped so tightly around me. Uh, looking back now, I realize he must have been watching me for a while because he never tried to cover my mouth. He must have known that I was mute. Even though it was just a few seconds, it felt like time slowed. I couldn't move, like my brain just wouldn't tell my body to move or something. I remember seeing the sidewalk get further away as he pulled me back into the alley. Finally, my body woke up, and I started flailing as hard as I could. I don't know if he was actually strong or if he was just because of his age, but his grip felt like it was going to crush me. I kept trying to reach my hand up to grab my whistle and try to get it in my mouth, but my arms were pinned at my sides with his arms around me. I was kicking my legs as hard as I could. I felt so helpless. No matter how hard I tried, I could not break free, not even a little bit. I remember a thought flashing in my head that this was the kind of thing my mom and teachers had always warned us about. It made me even more scared. I tried kicking my heels back into him, hoping maybe I'd get lucky and nail a shin or something. No such luck. It just made him squeeze me tighter. He was squeezing so tight I could barely breathe. I guess it was the combination of being squeezed like that in the fear of what was happening. But I started feeling dizzy and faint. And that was the most terrifying moment because I felt like if everything went black that I'd never wake up again. My head was starting to droop down and I could feel myself getting very weak. From out on the street, I heard someone scream and I managed to raise my eyes and saw two figures running towards us and yelling. The guy holding me immediately let me go. I had been up in the air and kind of landed on the concrete in a heap, gasping. I was shaking so hard. My backpack felt like it weighed a thousand pounds. I could hear the footsteps of the two people running towards us and the footsteps of the other guy running away down the other side of the alley. I could feel one of them tear past me. I felt the breeze as he passed and even heard the sound of it in my ear. The other person must not have wanted to leave me there and stopped. I was still in this daze, a little dizzy and in some kind of shock I guess. I felt their hand touch my shoulder and ask if I was okay. This jolted me out of the daze and I just bolted. I didn't look at them or anything. I just took off down the alleyway and sprinted to our house. I got inside, locked the door and just collapsed into a ball in the foyer. All my emotions caught up with me then and I just sobbed and sobbed. I laid there for what felt like forever. I was still there when my brother came in from practice. I was still very visibly upset and he immediately wanted to know what was wrong. 
I explained what happened, though I'm sure it was not nearly as coherent as the way I'm telling you now since I was still extremely shook up. He called the police immediately and then my mom. My brother was a decently sized guy and I'm sure he wanted to hurt the smelly guy down, but he sat on the steps with me in his lap until the police came. The police in that area don't exactly have the best response times, but they actually arrived fairly quickly. My mom got there shortly after they did, of course, out of her mind with worry and anger. My brother and mom helped me relay to the police what happened. I communicate through ASL and they translate to the police for me. Since I couldn't give a description, I never actually saw the guy. They said they'd be on the lookout for anyone acting suspicious, but the chances of finding him were extremely slim. However, it turns out the two guys that ran into the alley to help me had called the police as well and were able to give somewhat of a description, though apparently the guy had a knit cap with a hood up as well, so unless he was wearing the same clothes, he'd be hard to find. To be honest, I don't think the police really took it that seriously overall since Baltimore is a pretty dangerous place and way worse crimes happen there constantly. They gave me the whole be careful from now on speech and left. My mother and brother checked in with them pretty regularly for quite a while, but they never found the guy. Needless to say, my mom definitely didn't let me walk home by myself anymore. I began taking the bus, which would drop me off right at our house, and my brother worked it out with his coaches that he could be home when I got home. We ended up moving to Washington State a few years later when I was 12, and I only go back to Baltimore every once a year or so to visit my grandparents, though I never went back to our old neighborhood again. I hate to think about what would have happened to me had those two guys not run into that alleyway after me. Thank you to them. I'm eternally grateful. I was on a cruise ship for Thanksgiving and went with my entire family. As an attempt to get away from my brothers, I stayed in my grandparents' cabin. On the first day of the cruise ship, I walked around meeting people and some of the people I met were really into basketball, as I was. So we set up a scrimmage late at night so we could all eat dinner and whatnot. The only problem was that the basketball courts closed at 7, so we would have to sneak in. My little group was playing every day and became my late night routine. Skip forward to the last night on board where my group was playing a pickup game as we always did. I felt a buzz from my pocket. So I stopped playing for a second and read my text message. It was from an unknown number saying to go check on your grandparents. So not thinking twice, I said goodnight to my friends and went to my floor. After the long walk and the elevator ride, I made it to my floor. I arrived on the complete opposite side of my room, so it was a long walk. As I was walking, I see this tattooed man staring at me on my left side. I am a paranoid person, so of course I admittedly thought something was going to happen. We walked past each other, no problem, but he stops and says, Excuse me, did you see the gentleman who came out of this room? And I replied, No. The mini conversation was over. We both went our ways, so I thought. I took a glance behind and now he was walking in my direction. I sort of slow down to see if he will pass, but when he gets close enough, I remark, I'm such an idiot, my room is on the other side. The creepy man looks a little angry and says, You're lying. Your room's at the front. Here, let me take you to your grandparents. My face turned white. However, I knew what would lie ahead of me if I went with him, so I took off running. I looked behind me to see if he was chasing me, but he wasn't so I stopped running and started walking. I was relieved until I heard loud footsteps, so I looked behind me once again and it was the man, chasing after me, so I started to run again. The man caught up and grabbed me, but for some reason I was so scared I couldn't let out a scream. I was hoping someone would come out of their room to save me, but like I said, it was the middle of the night and nobody was around. He took me to this room where there was no furniture, I looked in and there was this woman sitting on the ground in the shadows. I could tell she was overweight. The guy shoved me in and told the lady, My shift is over, I'm going to sleep. The dark figure nodded. 
Again, I was still in complete shock. My legs felt like 300 pound weights. The woman grabbed me and said, I'm getting married soon, so this is the last amount of fun I'm going to have. Don't forget, I was a minor at this time. My vision was fading in and out. I thought I was going to collapse, but suddenly the buffet was coming up in my stomach and I threw up on her. After that, I left the room and sprinted all the way to my grandparents' room. I got in there, double bolted the locks. My grandparents woke up and said, was everything okay? And I was thinking, let me spill my guts over what just happened. However, I said the security guard found my friends playing basketball, so we all ran from him. They said okay and went back to sleep. Meanwhile, I just stayed in the bathroom all night, not because of the buffet, but I was terrified. The guy must have been stalking me and seen me go to my room with my grandparents over the few on board. So I was really freaked out, thinking he knew my room. I stayed up all night, but there were no problems. My family created a plan to go to brunch in the dining hall, so we all got up at 8 and went there. The waiter was taking us to our seats. I was scanning the area when I noticed the same man who chased me yesterday with an overweight woman and a couple of other goons. They saw me too, so they all started staring at me. My whole family went to be seated, but I was in the middle of a staring contest. Luckily, my mom saw me and saw what was going on. My mom looked at me and then looked at the table and said, The guy with all the tattoos proposed to the girl a few nights back. I said out loud, Oh my god. My mom hit me again and said, Hey, watch your mouth and go sit down. I ended up sitting down so my back was to the table of creeps. I never said a word about what happened that night and I don't plan on telling my family because I'm worried they won't take me to cruises in the future. However, I was texting my new friends from the basketball courts and told them what happened that night. One of them said, I was chased by the same man. However, I was able to outrun him before he caught me. I was a bit relieved I got that off my chest and wasn't alone in my situation. I still didn't decide to tell anyone else. I really don't understand how these people got my phone number. I was in a relationship with whom at the time I thought was the perfect man for me. We traveled all the time and discovered a lot of incredible places together. We were madly in love. People could see it. Strangers stopped us on the street to comment on what a radiant couple we were. Just after our third anniversary together, he decided he was sick of living in the suburbs and would be moving downtown, closer to his business. He asked for my input, so we went to look at apartments one day. We walked into a dream place. After seeing some really terrible ones, he got down on one knee and said, I knew you would love it. It's ours already. Would you marry me? Of course I said yes. I was bursting with happiness. We moved in straight away, the most blissful six months of my life. We planned an awesome wedding. It was a dream. I had just been laid off of my job, so I had plenty of time to be a homemaker and he appreciated it. He thanked me every morning for his breakfast and clean clothes. He fantasized about our future children and all the great things we'd do together. Then one night he came home from work, a different person. He refused to even touch me or look me in the eye. Out of nowhere he said, This is not what I want for myself. Give me the ring back and leave, please. It made no sense, but he wouldn't talk to me. He let me grab a coat, handbag, and money from my drawer and told me a cab would be ready downstairs. He literally pushed me out the door as I cried and begged for an explanation. I had nowhere to go, but he didn't care. I ended up in my mother's house screaming hysterically. My whole world had collapsed. He refused all my calls. All my possessions were in that apartment and he didn't care. I had to borrow clothes from my sister, take hand-me-downs from friends never recovered any of it. The wedding cancellation fell on me too. It didn't take long to find out that he had been seeing someone else since she became pregnant. They married three weeks after he kicked me out. I fell into a deep depression and lost the will to live. 
I was skeletally thin and my mother made me go inpatient and work on moving on. It took about six months before I actually started leaving the house and interacting with people again. And then it happened. He started incessantly calling and texting me. Non-stop. 60 texts per day. Can we talk? Can we meet? I just need to see you. I miss you so much. I knew I didn't have the mental strength to face him, so I just ignored it. A barrage of emails followed. He made a mistake and wanted to get back together, pick up where we left. What? He was married with a baby on the way. He didn't just get drunk and kiss a stranger, but that was his whole attitude. I didn't reply. He started sending pricey gifts to my mother's house. I asked her to decline them all, say she didn't know where I was. His emails became deranged rants. This woman had scammed him, forced him, threatened him. He never meant to cheat on me, let alone leave me. He didn't even know how he had ended up marrying her. He actually hated her. I honestly wondered if he was hooked on hard drugs or something. Then my friends started complaining. My ex, his employees, his brother and or cousin had started contacting them to try and set up a surprise meeting with me to fix things. It was unnerving. His friends turned up at my sister's workplace. His cousin followed my mother in a mall. My best friend was being followed constantly. He somehow found out where I was receiving therapy and turned up a few times, demanding information on my treatment and appointments. Police had to be called. I started to fear for my safety and became extremely paranoid. He left me a voicemail detailing how his wife was in labor, but as soon as she was done, he was filing for divorce. Could we please meet that night? He appealed to a lot of our happy memories and then with no remorse said, The kid can have my name, but I want nothing to do with him ever. I just want you and our days road tripping. I miss everything about you, all the time. It felt so callous and manipulative. I replied in a text, Stop looking for me. Stop calling, just stop. Now go tend to your wife and love your firstborn. This somehow made things worse. Almost everywhere I went, a black van would be waiting for me. I recognized his employee. He looked sadly at me and gestured, I'm sorry. His instructions were to follow me until he found my new boyfriend and to convince me to go back. His wife and baby had been kicked out of the apartment and he was waiting for me. He wouldn't give up on us. This man was everywhere I went. My mental health declined rapidly. Finally, I decided to get away on a long vacation and save my sanity. I shut down all my social media and took a cab to the airport at midnight. Not six hours after landing in Vancouver, I had a string of emails from him demanding to know where I was. He also flew to Vancouver and would not quit until we met and got back together. I couldn't believe it. Hoping he wouldn't figure out the rest of my itinerary, I told him I was willing to meet up at Stanley Park and arrange a time which was the time my next flight left for New Zealand. Things turned for me since then and I ended up moving here. I'd be lying if I said I didn't do it to get away from him, that insanity he was putting me through. It's been ten years and only recently did he tone it down. He stalked me on Twitter for a while, tracked my government job email, came to Auckland twice in hopes of bumping into me, and occasionally still sends me messages regretting the fact that we won't be together forever, that my daughter is not his child, and assuring me I'll always be the love of his life. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data located on both Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, in your lifetime, you eat over a million spiders 
while you sleep.